We are now rolling. Start. I suppose that uh, no writer has written as clearly about how incomprehensible the world is than Franz Kafka. And um, yet he... Re I'm, I'm sorry, I've got to come in. We should have the introductions first. Oh, I see. See, well. that was just testing before. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's okay. go around okay. with the names All right. okay. first. Speaking yes. Okay, uh, my name is Ron Shepard. And I am Dr. Alexander Lowen. My name is Isaac Bashava Singer. Let's do it once more. Just that. My name is Ron Shepard. And I am Dr. Alexander Lowen. My name is Isaac Bashava Singer. I suppose no modern writer has written so clearly about how incomprehensible the world is. Uh, I better do that over, I guess. Go ahead. Uh, I, uh, I suppose no modern writer has written as clearly as Franz Kafka about the incomprehensibility of the world, and yet Kafka remains a considerable puzzle to most readers. Uh, I mean, his stories and his novels, uh, on one hand, seem to be fables out of, of, about animals. And he also, and he has been also interpreted as, as having the last word on the, uh, the the totalitarian state. Somewhere in between, though, Kafka, there's Kafka the man, living in a very special time, coming out of a very special background, and writing in his own very special way. So special, in fact, that no one knew him during. Very, he only was known by a small circle of writers during his lifetime. Well, I'll just say we're here to now. Uh, I guess to. Uh, if you want, can you lead into a question to throw out? Okay. To yeah. one, of the, one of the participants, uh, and then you come in on the question also. Ka Kafka's been uh, called uh, a, a neurotic artist, and he's also been called a artist of neuroses. And I'd like to ask Dr. Lowen uh, if he could discuss the, the first part of that question, the first part of that statement as a neurotic artist, if you could. Well, it's um, difficult these days to say that anybody is healthy. Uh, I think every writer writes because he has a need to express his, his struggle with the uh, forces within his own personality. And writing is, in a sen one sense, a catharsis, in another sense, a creative act. On the other hand, the, the problems he faces as an individual reflect in part the problems everyone faces in a certain cultural setting. So that it's not fair to look at the neurotic aspect of the writer. It's, it's really more important to see what these problems are that he feels on the one hand and that are reflected in the society on the other. Well, could we get then to the special circumstances, the time and the place that Kafka lived? His Jewishness, his his feel, his the fact that he lived near the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, in a uh, there was a crisis, obviously a crisis of faith. He had, it seems that one part of him wanted to be the good burger and and the good middle class man, and the other part was was the artist. It seemed that there's a great spiritual conflict arising in a good part from his. Jewish heritage and his relationship with his father. And I, I wonder if, Mr. Singer, would you discuss that? I will tell you, one of the things which are very important for every writer is to have roots in life, roots in the, in the family, roots in the country where he lives and in his environment. And Kafka suffered from, from a great a case of rootlessness. He was a Jew but he did not get a Jewish kind of education which a Jew should get. 
He was supposed to be a Czech because he lived in, in, in Prague, but he wasn't a Czech. I, he must have spoken the Czech language, but actually his, his uh, mother language was German. Neither was he really a German because, because Czechs were not Germans. They only used the German language. It was forced on them. I would say that in Kafka, all these misfortunes, literary misfortunes and human misfortunes, concentrated. He wanted to be a Jew, but he had no way how to become a Jew. He might have wanted to be a Czech, but although I doubt, but also at the time was not because uh, Czechoslovakia was under German uh, rule. He had no roots. And actually, if, if you would have asked Tolstoy if a man like Kafka could write, he would say a man like this can never write. Having no roots, having really no language, no, no real environment, he's out of literature, or, at, or I would say literature would be very difficult for him, and Kafka knew it. As a matter of fact, when a Yiddish uh, theater came to Prague in 1911, and this was a bad Yiddish theater, Kafka was so hot about it that he thought really that these actors are great actors and these miserable plays were, were Shakespearean plays. He fell in love with, with a Yiddish actress who was a bad actress, a Miss uh, uh, Chizik, I think was her name, and he fell in love with her because he saw in her another Rachel or, or God knows, uh, or a Sarah Bernard. Rootlessness was his tragedy, and, but he, being a genius as he was, or born high, a highly talented man, he tried to make a virtue of these defects, of these sins. So I would say <clears throat> that his being ruthless in a way disturbed him very much and made him very neurotic and very unhappy and very self-conscious. But at the same time, time, it made him become a Kafka. Because if he would have roots, he might have been another good writer. It, it struck me, uh, with reference, with respect to the trial, that the hero of the trial is Joseph K. And K, of course, is the initial of Kafka's name. And in a sense... In dealing with the trial, we're also dealing with the man. Always. And okay, yeah. as we study the book itself, uh, we'll see that the problems of K must be the problems of Kafka, and I think we'll get into that soon. Good. Well, maybe this is a, a, not a bad time to, to uh, go into the book. Uh, uh, It strikes me that, that one of the things in the book is its, uh, its humor, but of a very uh, a deep and painful kind. Sardonic, would you say? Extremely sardonic. I mean, you have, the, uh, you have the, just the action where you have a, a, a rather pompous clerk in a, on a bank uh, being arrested in the morning, and the humorous touches, I just just to tick them off, which I think the humor sets up the horror too. I mean the conflict, the contradiction between the humor and the horror. I mean he's arrested when he, he wakes in the morning. His breakfast isn't ready. And the reason his breakfast isn't ready is because the man, the men who came to arrest him have eaten his breakfast. Yeah. They then go on to uh, to uh, tell him that his underwear is too good a quality to wear. They then go on to Tell him what to wear. Uh, he's then allowed to go to work, where uh, where everybody in the bank congratulates him that it's his thirtieth birthday. All these things begin these humor this humor begins to build up, and underneath it, you feel the sinister move the sinister motions of the plot and what is happening. Uh, his humor, in his own life, Max Brode, his, uh, his biographer, said that he was a very amusing man, that when he read his stories, the Metamorphosis, for example, he would laugh, he'd giggle while he was reading his stories to his friends. But where does his humor, in the kind of personality that Kafka certainly must have had, uh, uh, how do you see this humor? As a well, if you take the book, The Trial, uh, if he couldn't poke fun at uh, the situation in which he found himself, Joseph K., for example, or Kafka in writing the book, 
it would be awfully grim. So grim that you couldn't even write about it. It's only the humor that saves the book from being unreadable in a sense. Because the plot itself is too sinister in a way. Almost too devastating to the human, con- human being. What do you think, Dr. I feel I feel, Dr. Lohan, when, when I began to read Kafka, which is not a, too long a time ago, I asked myself, what is it all about? Because I, I heard a lot of praise about him, but I'm not the kind of a man who would just take praise because others praised him. I tried to find out myself what is there. And I said to myself that there is in every writer once in a while, or maybe often, a desire to let go. By let go, I mean to forget all the rules of the game, all the things which need to, you need to have. Let's say you need to have a plot, you need to have uh, living uh, heroes, and so on. I guess that Kafka decided that since he cannot get all these things because of this condition which I mentioned before, that he had no roots in life, he had, so to say, to play chess against the rule of chess. Like as a chess player would, would decide he's going to play a game of chess with himself and he will let the, the king go like a knight and a rook and the rook uh, jump like a knight or two knights and so on and so on. There is such a thing that people who, who double in, in their cult, what they call automatic writing. They sit down with a pencil and let, so to say, the hand do, do the job f- for itself. It is true that the brain takes part in it, but they are not too much conscious of it. They just let go. And my feeling is that this is really what, what Kafka decided to do in all his works. Because... The, 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 the book The Trial or the book The Castle and so on, from a literary point of view, he has committed so many sins that I would say he has committed all the sins which a writer can commit. The construction isn't right. The man K whom he describes is not really a living person. He's nothing but a, but a, a, a letter a K. His action, there is not, no real consistency in his action. Sometimes he's very daring and sometimes he's very shy. He really don't know what the man is going to do. Now, if a writer would do this in, in a conventional novel, they would simply say it, he has failed in the most miserable way. It's not a novel at all. It's a boring kind of a stuff, and it would be dismissed really as, as, as junk or shunt or, whatever, or pulp, whatever you write such novels. But what is interesting in Kafka is that he, I think, is perhaps the only writer who succeeded to, to write in an automatic way and at the same time to make sense. The reason for it is that since he could not, he could not and there was no possibility for him to write like the conventional writer, his decision to write in the unconventional way was so strong and the personality behind it was also so strong that he just did as he pleased and he managed to create a great kind of a puzzle. I don't, I don't think that there is a single critic living today who could say exactly what this allegory or fable is about. It is about uh, providence, and it is about God, it is about justice, but, but we don't need all these details for this. In addition, why do we need such an allegory? We know ourselves that, that life is bitter and that the justice is not just. So I would say here has a man really let the subconscious do what it wanted. He said to his pen, go and, and work for your own, in your own way. Bring out whatever you want. The only thing is he kept to a certainty because if not, it would have become completely chaotic. He had a certain plan, and the plan was the trial. The meaning of the trial is that every human being actually is always in a trial. If, if you get sick, this means that your body is in a trial. Either, either the judges of health will, will, will decide that you are healthy or, God forbid, die, and so on and so on. So because of this, I would never try to, to explain Kafka or even to say that he was a humorist. I don't know if he was a humorist. There is a feeling of humor in it, but it's, it's hidden. But what I would say is that here is a man, a writer who has for the first time let his subconscious write novels, and he succeeded in his own terms. Dr. S- Ms. Singer, it's very interesting 
Um, my impression of a story, you know, goes along a little bit with what you've said in a different vein. Um, first, I had a very strong feeling from the writing yes. and the description of the scenes that the story itself has a black and white quality, uh, not even gray, although the fog comes in at times through the windows and the sense of grayness is there. But the black and white and the grayness reminds me very much as if the sequence of this story could be a dream sequence. And it's interesting that the chapters start out anew every time. In other words, there's very little explanation of the space, of the time. A new, a new topic. So from to one say, chapter yeah. to another. This is the way a dream happens. Suddenly the scene flashes you jump and you're from another one dream sequence. to another. Exactly. Yes, yes. And this is again on the subconscious level. But I, I, I think that if he let go, he was also quite meticulous in his writing because he, he changed, the, you know, he, he rewrote a lot of things and some sentences and maybe paragraphs were taken out and there's a lot of fragments of this that was finally put together. I would say, Dr. Lowen, that he was the, uh, the happy man who could edit his dreams. While we cannot edit our dreams, they, they just uh, go like this. He did edit, but I would say he accepted them. He accepted them as they are. And it is my deepest conviction that if Kafka would have been sitting here, he would have asked him, Mr. Kafka, what did you mean by the trial or by the castle? He would have said, I don't know. Because he, he, he did know and he did not know. Because all these details which are there don't explain anything. And, and I think that no matter how much the professors will try to give sense to it and to make it as a solid construction, they will never succeed because it wasn't meant to be a solid construction. It was meant really to be the stuff of which dreams are made. Well, the one book that uh, the trial reminds me of most is Alice in Wonderland. I had that same feeling. Uh, the, uh, the way in which uh, behavior was so erratic the, uh, the court scene, the washerwoman in the back is suddenly assaulted yeah. by someone and screams and throws her head back yes. and screams. He hires a lawyer, and, he go and the lawyer's servant is a, is a sort of a prostitute. Yeah, and the lawyer is sick all the time And the, the lawyer doesn't bed. get out of yeah. bed. Yeah. Uh, nothing happens according, according to, uh, to logic, to, to logic. Oh. which means in a way that, that Kafka was trying to say, or through these, through these images and these words, that he didn't understand his world, that he was apart from his world. Or could, you say, could you say, if you throw it in, that he saw the absurdity of his world, just as Carol did, you know, in Through the Looking Glass, Alice in Wonderland, and that his humor was in poking fun at this in a very subtle way, just over the surface, covering the surface of the tragedy of this world. And he also, but I, the interesting thing about it is, unlike many writers who can observe the absurdity of the world, like we think of Joseph Heller in Catch-22, which is a kind of Kafka. And God knows that that overused word, Kafka-esque, Kafka -esque, is a yeah. terrible word. I mean, it just keeps, I mean, it's used as a crutch so many times. Uh, that, that, abs that many writers are perfectly, can see the absurdity of the world and make black humor out of it. But the thing that separates Kafka, and to me is a great paradox, is he knew the, there was a flaw in the world. Something had happened to the world, and yet he was guilty. Well, isn't he was that guilty about something that wasn't his fault. Now that seems to, now I think if we ask why was that, we might get down to some of the roots of his problems from a clinical point of view. I'd, I'd like to inject one thing here, just to pick up on something that uh, Mr. Shepard has brought up in relation to the guilt. I'd like to point out that uh, there is a logic to the, the figures of each woman who appears. For example, the arrest is made from Frau Burstner's room. The door that connects his room to hers is the door where the, the man comes from who says, you are under arrest. And each woman represents his perception of women. So I, I would like to pick this up. Well, we can get into that more deeply. But uh, we have to ask ourselves a very important question here if we're going to try to understand the trial. Uh, I think you're right about the flaw in the world. 
and about the underlying sense of guilt in the human beings who make up this world, because it's a world of human beings, not a world of nature we're dealing with here. The flaw, therefore, is in all of us. And Kafka, in a sense, uh, writing for Joseph K., feels the guilt that this flaw imposes, you know, upon each person. He feels it. What the uh, existential analysts have later called existential guilt, that all human beings have an inherent sense of guilt about themselves. See? And now Kafka felt that about himself and has struggled to resolve it. And it's very interesting to see how that struggle evolved in the course of the trial. Because he, I think, in more than just a writer, I would regard Kafka as a philosopher of real merit from the way this book is written. When we consider the alternatives that are posed, for example, and uh, the scene that takes place in the cathedral with the priest, it's really very deep. And I think we should spend a little time on that. I would say sometime. that in the cathedral, he suddenly uh, stops describing and, he be and, and becomes an essay. The in this chapter, suddenly there is an essay written uh, from, by Kafka about guilt and about judgment and, so on, and a religion which he didn't have in his first chapters. And this too is, a, so to say, a giving oneself freedom that that does not matter. You can, write, you can t uh, tell a story, you can, in the middle of the story, you can also write an essay that everything is a lot. Exactly what this priest uh, is and, and what he... What he wants to say is not clear. One thing is clear, when, that Kafka, for him, the law, what he calls law, means, means actually God or also nature. He says that there are many gates to the law, and the further you go, the, st the stronger these gates are, and the more fear fearsome are these, these guardians of, of this law. But if you ask me what connection has this essay with the whole novel, I will say, a very loose connection. It does not connect it too well. We see that the man is going to be killed by the same law, but what his sin is, he, he never divulges to us. Well, I would say that his sin is the very fact that he was born, that he's a human being, because what other guilt has... has right. Yes. But not, not a human being in the generic sense of the term, yes. because that would mean that we would have to look back over thousands of years really, I mean, more than civilized human beings to understand a human being, but certainly the guilt that lies in a civilized human being. In a modern man. In a modern man, exactly. Because Kafka is really a modern man, or at least the story takes place about a modern man, a man who's in the competitive world, you know that, because he is constantly competing to rise, where position, the hierarchy of position, becomes very important, and this was typical of his time, somewhat typical still of our time, too. And the pressures of rising, being subordinate or being superior, were very great. Keeping up one's appearance becomes an important element of this. When, they, when the uh, court asks him, you're a, you're a painter, a, a house painter, he's very, very taken back. And he says, no, I'm a head clerk in a bank. Mm. Uh, to the point about Kafka as a modern man, which I think may get to the really spiritual uh, problems of Kafka is when you read his fables, the, the, the stories, which I like to call fables in a way, I seem to, I, the one thing that strikes me in them as, a, as, a, as opposed to old-fashioned fables, of fairy tales, in the old-fashioned fairy tale, the frog can turn into a prince somehow by the right kind of words, by the right motion, by a kiss, by the redeeming love or something. In Kafka, that never happens. There's no grace. No grace ever descends in a Kafka story. He is, he is, that was what, to me, makes him the preeminent modern writer. Right, right. And describing the modern condition in some sense. I mean, the metamorphosis. If the metamorphosis were, were written by or came out of the oral tradition, you know, of, of fairy tales, the beetle would somehow be redeemed. Right. But here it's just swept away uh, as, a, as a piece of garbage. Uh, and in the last line, the very last line of the trial, when, when this Joseph K., who was really a fool in a way, 
Why do you say that? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't true. say that either. Well, he's, he's, he comes, he's so pompous and he's so... I would say that, that he suffers from, from the fact that he is a man almost without any free will. Without free will? Without free will. You don't uh, find okay. in Kafka's writing that man has a choice, that he could have uh, acted differently. You have a feeling that he is dragged. The only thing <clears throat> is what is wrong... I mean, wrong from, 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 from the point of view of a genius is that, in a way, everything is arbitrary. Because we are accustomed in, in literature and even in life that even, even if, if there is no free will, at least there is cause and effect, that there is always something which, which happens and makes you, let's say, if someone uh, lifts up a knife against you, you run or you do this. He has really belittled the causality altogether. You don't know, sometimes he acts so as if that would mean nothing to him. It's just nothing. And all the time he's terribly afraid, and you don't know why he's afraid. But the last line where he said, where his eyes like are a dimming dog. and he's dying like a dog. He says like a dog, like a dog. which means really that, that uh, like a dog, he had no choice whatsoever. See, right. He was dragged from the beginning to the end. As far as guilt is concerned, I, I wouldn't say that guilt is only uh, an emotion of modern men, because the feeling of guilt of, of is, is, is as old as religion is. They have it in, in the Christian religion, and there is also in the Hebrew religion, which they call Chet uh, Kadmen, which means the first sin. It seems that according to the Kabbalists, or according to uh, certain religious men, the very fact that man has decided, so to say, to get a certain autonomy, to act almost as if it would be God himself, to build his own nest, to, to, to take care of his own business, was a sin. Because it means he stopped relying on, on the Almighty, and he tried to, to do things for himself, while the animals and the plants really more or less are always in the hands of God that this kind of sin is really the guilt, the guilt of human beings. And I would say that in the trial you feel also this, that not only Kafka himself is being judged, but we are all judged by the fact that we have taken the liberty, so to say, to act as if we would have free will, while we don't have. And in the trial, the free will is, disappears almost, almost completely. He comes to fire the lawyer, but somehow he does not fire him. He comes there to, to ask advice, and suddenly he plays around with, with a woman for whom he has no feelings. There is, a, there is one point in this story where uh, Joseph K., you know, the protagonist, becomes a real a person you can admire. Let me throw two thoughts out to you. Ever since psychoanalysis proved that most of our proved, you know, as far as we accept Trying it, to prove. That, that so much of our behavior is conditioned by what happened to us, the question of free will has been attacked more and more. And I myself, I'm not uh, sure whether there is such a question as free will. I look upon it this way, just to throw it out to you, that we must believe we have free will, and in retrospect we find that we acted according to our character or the you know, the background which we grew up in, etc. You see, there's one view looking forward and one view looking backward. If you choose to have free will, I suppose there's free will. Or at least the well, illusion of free will. The illusion the of free will, we don't know. See, that's enough. one of the things we can't decide. But to, th to go back to the question of uh, the hero here and his, and his role in this book, mm. there were three alternatives presented to him, you recall, by... Uh, in the, next, in the second to the last chapter, when he discusses, uh, when he seeks advice from another accused man called Block, and the three alternatives were um, a definite acquittal, if you remember. Yeah. Um, was the second one a... Uh, there was a definite acquittal, then there was something that it, it would go... Dra an ostensible forever. acquittal, Stensible. and then a postponement. Yeah. But it ends that the first one was really not available at all. No. There is no such thing as a definite acquittal. Then you could have an ostensible acquittal, which meant that uh, even though you might be acquitted, you are not really acquitted and you could be arrested tomorrow. Yeah. And then you can drag the case on for years and years, uh, hoping merely to live it out, right? Now, this relates a lot to where modern people are at. And the washerwoman says yeah. to him, uh, says, I, I know as much as the judge about yeah. all this, and yeah. I assure you this is a lower court, 
And even if they acquit you, a higher court can arrest you on the same charge. Right. So there is no... There's a judgment, but there is, there is no... Um, uh, 